Now we're looking at the office of elder, the plurality of the elder. Some say, as we pointed out last week, that it must be plural. We showed that the New Testament does not give any basis for insisting that it's plural and that 1 Timothy 3 suggests a single elder for a local church. Now that's where we stopped. Now I have another passage that they also use, and that's 1 Timothy 5.17. 1 Timothy 5.17. And some regard, from this verse, they regard the eldership as consisting of two classes within the office of elder, and thus a plurality. Two classes within the office of elder, and thus a plurality. Because here we have the mention of teaching and ruling elders. And so some try to insist that, that means two different kinds of elders, therefore a plurality of elders. <coughs> teaching and ruling elders. First Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now again, the text is clear as it stands. You'd have to have someone wanting to try to prove plurality to get that out of the verse. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Well, he's not talking about another class when he says, and especially those who rule well and teach also, you know, labor in the word. So you don't get two classes out of it to begin with. But anyway, the institutional church, some of them have added an ecclesiastical system on the basis of this verse, and they end up with teaching elders who act as pastors and ruling elders who are lay brothers, lay leaders. Teaching elders are the pastors, ruling elders are the lay leaders. The lay leaders may constitute an ecclesiastical order, like, for example, a deacon board or an official board. I sometimes wonder where they get these titles out of the New Testament, official board. That one always stuck in my craw, but I lived with it while I was in the system, but it stuck in my craw. That's as far as it got, but I didn't always rock the boat tried to live with people until it just became impossible to be in the system and be consistent. But as we say, the text is clear as it stands. These are not two classes of elders, but as the New Testament shows, both these are qualifications for the office of elder. That is to say, in 1 Timothy 3, both these things, ruling and teaching, is a responsibility, is one of the qualifications for the office of elder, bishop. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, and verses 4 and 5. Both these responsibilities are listed as qualifications for the office of elder in 1 Timothy 3, not two classes. 1 Timothy 3, 2. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Of course, we know that word bishop is elder in the Greek. Husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. See, every elder, every pastor should teach. Very few do. It's mostly evangelistic type sermons three times a week. We know how that goes, but he's supposed to be apt to teach. Then verses 4 and 5, and he's one that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now look at verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how can he rule the church of God or take care of the church of God? And so ruling and teaching are both qualifications for the one office. If a bishop desire the office, he must teach, he must show that he can rule the church because he rules his house well. Then in Titus 1.9, I think they're both linked together also. Titus 1.9, a bishop should hold fast the faithful word he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers.
in Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, there is a combination, again, a combining of the teaching and ruling. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. Remember them which have the rule over you and who have spoken unto you the word of God. So there's the idea of the word of God linked with the rule. Obey them which have the rule over you and submit to them. 1 Thessalonians 5.12 And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Well, they admonish you through the word. The idea there of teaching, of course, is through the word of God. They are over you in the Lord and they admonish you or teach you. And Acts 20, 28, which we've read several times, which states that the Holy Spirit has made the elders overseers or bishop and they are to feed the flock over which God has made them, overseers, our guardians. So ruling and teaching are combined in all these passages, but especially in the passage which gives the qualifications, 1 Timothy 3. He's to be apt to teach and to rule well. And so 1 Timothy 5.17, the verse they try to get two classes of elders, thus plurality of elders, out of, is simply recognizing the fact that some elders excel, as they do today, some elders excel in teaching. But all have the same responsibilities and the same gifts. As all the passages that we've dealt with thus far will show that all elders have the same gifts. That of oversight, thus a bishop or elder, and that of feeding the flock or teaching. But they don't all have the same measure of both those gifts. So that's why the admonition in 1 Timothy 5.17 to obey those who have the rule over you, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. You see, some elders, like we know today, some elders or pastors excel more in the shepherdship role, the role of the shepherd. Doesn't mean he doesn't teach. God hasn't given him a special gift of teaching, but he's to teach. He's to be apt to teach. Others excel more in teaching than in the shepherdship aspect, but doesn't mean that they're not to be shepherds. Some excel in both. This is the one he has reference to in 1 Timothy 5.17. He says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now, ruling well here implies that they're taking the time to rule well, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. Not all labor in the word of teaching. So as we're saying, they both have the same gifts, but they don't all have it to the same measure. But of course, the implication is there in 1 Timothy 5.17 that there's some who take more seriously, maybe, their responsibilities too. And so I don't believe you could get plurality of eldership out of 1 Timothy 5.17. You wouldn't have thought it as you were reading it, I'm sure. Now, another question concerning the office. Is the office permanent? The office of elder permanent? This is a question that is sometimes raised and quite significant. It's always good to know the answer to some of these questions, especially if you're in it, because if you don't know whether or not your appointment's from heaven, then men could tell you that you don't qualify and they could put you out. Not on the basis of these qualifications, but because maybe you didn't cooperate with the denomination the way they thought you should or whatever. Is the office of elder permanent? Well, the institutional church, we look at that first. It licenses and ordains its elders. And then appoints them or elects them, appoints them or elects them by vote to the office of elder in a local church. In the institutional system, they both license and ordain their elders. And they either appoint them by a board or they are elected to that office in a local church. And in the denominational system, you can be removed from that office for any one of many reasons. 
and you're no longer an elder. You can even have your license revoked by the system and you're no longer licensed to preach. <laughs> well, if they can license you and ordain you, then they can take it back. That's true. So we're even raising the question, where do you get your ordination to begin with? They can remove an elder from office in the system for any one of many reasons. I say it may be a lack of full denominational cooperation. Sometimes it may be for unchristian conduct, and that would be a valid reason as far as them not recommending him or letting people know he's not approved by the church. But often it's just party strife. A group just doesn't like the pastor. In fact, any voting congregation, you always have a group that do not like the pastor. There's no such thing as unity of mind. Voting system, you see, promotes the idea of division. And so sometimes they get rid of him just because they don't like the way he talks or parts his hair or whatever. Ridiculous reasons. Some may be dismissed for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That happens. Or the message being too strong. Or as Brother Reeser, he wasn't dismissed when he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he prayed for the sick. When they found out that, why, they just flew into a rage. I thought they would have gotten him on the tongues. He didn't hide it. He let them know he'd received it and spoken tongues, but he said the reason they put me out of the pastorate was they found out I was praying for the sick. The devil couldn't take that. So under this system, sometimes the title goes only with the office. That is, one is an elder only while he's functioning as a pastor in a church. The title goes only with the office many times. That means one is an elder, recognized as an elder, only when he's functioning as a pastor in a church. He's not an elder between pastorates in that definition. Because, you see, they make much of the Latin word pastor, and as soon as you say pastor, you think of a building and a church and a denomination, and if you're between pastorates, you can't say I'm pastor. So they only recognize you as an elder. Now, if you said elder, then you could be an elder between pastorates, maybe six months or a year sometimes between them in the system. <laughs> well, there can be a lot of reasons why they don't call you. I know in the system that I was under when I was teaching in the seminary, they still had a church, you know, that went along with it, and they were without a pastor. And this is gospel truth. One candidate for the pastor of that church came and preached his trial sermon, but he weighed about 400 pounds at least. Then they listened to him, then the next Wednesday they got up and voted whether they wanted to call him or not. And one of the reasons that one got up and said that he didn't think they should call him is because none of the chairs would hold him. They'd have to reinforce all the seats. I just about crawled under the pew on that one. <laughs> I wasn't voting in those days, I was just listening. I got out of the voting habit way back. By the way, way back. We stopped voting even as Baptists way back, an independent Baptist church. So anyway, he wasn't a pastor between the offices. Now, others under the <coughs> institutional system, the title is for life but the office is only for the period of the appointment. The title of elder is for life. If you are once an elder, you're always an elder. But the office, you're no longer in the office unless you're appointed to some local church, you see. It's only for the period of appointment. Some systems have an annual call where they vote on the pastor every year. I've always wondered why a pastor would ever take such a pastor. I would never go under such conditions. If they wanted to get rid of me in those voting systems that I have served under, they could vote me out any time they wanted, but I would never go with that pressure every year. You never know where you're going to be back. And they do it for that purpose. If they don't like you, the color of your ties, if you wear them or whatever, the party in power will get you out. You see, they vote on you every year. You're an elder only for one year at a time under the, that system. Well, that's the institutional answer to the office of elder. Is it permanent? No. With qualifications, the title can be permanent, but never the office. Now, in the New Testament, you'll find that the fivefold ministry, which includes the elder, 
In the New Testament, the elder is not elected by men. He's not licensed by men. He's not appointed by men. It's a gift from heaven. Ephesians 4 and Acts 20:28. 20, so he's not under the control of men. And a pastor who doesn't know that will have to preach the system's message. Which you begin to discover why that I was never too popular in the system because I didn't have their message and I'd recognize my call was from heaven. Doesn't mean I defied them. I cooperated right up to the limit of my being able to stomach it. It's worse than we could describe if you don't already know that, Lord help you. I don't know of any greater bondage and anti-New Testament type Christianity than you find in the system. It is so bad that you could write a book on how bad it is. All of it. Any denomination. We don't hide that here. Now if we go to minister to them, that worries some people. If we go minister to them, then I don't go tell them that. I go tell them about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and try to get them saved. A lot of them need to be saved. So that eases the blood pressure of anybody that's got a problem. But our regular people don't have a problem. But some do because occasionally they let me know that apparently that isn't showing the proper respect or love. Well, I don't respect it and I don't love it. So I tell people I love the people. I hate the system. So I'll minister to the people, but not the system. But anyway, we know what our calling is, and we just have to accept the fact that we're going to call black, black and white, white, and not apologize for it, but we're not going to try to walk over you if you're a baby Christian or whatever. So you bear with it. You'll come to the place. You'll see denominations are Babylon. They're on their way out. God has written Ichabod over it. And if you're in the system very much longer, you'll either get persecution or the mark, one or the other. So I recognized, however it may sound to some ears, the fact I'd received a call from heaven. So while I didn't defy the system, I didn't rock the boat. At the same time, I didn't compromise. And of course, that keeps you in hot water with the system. They recognize that right away. Under the New Testament way, he keeps the office and the title for life. Now you find me a verse contrary to that, and we'll have a little discussion. In the New Testament system, an elder or any of the fivefold ministry keeps both the title and the office for life. He doesn't have to be serving anywhere to be an elder. He should be, that isn't what we're saying. But he doesn't lose it because some local church voted him out or whatever. Or he just got out of training and hasn't been called to church. So he keeps the title in the office for life. However, let us add that as with all offices, all of the church offices, deacon and the fivefold, it assumes you're functioning in it. The assumption is you are functioning because what would you need with an office and title not be functioning? But you don't lose it if you're not temporarily or for some reason other than scriptural reasons. So it assumes you're functioning, but not always necessarily without interruption. For example, when God called me in Florida, I was an elder right then. He put me right in ministry. That was my calling. If I didn't believe I had the calling, I wouldn't have gone off to prepare. What I need to prepare for to run a food market, which is what I was in. I'd already prepared for that. So I was an elder, but I refused to serve. People tried to get me to go out and hold pastors and all. I said, don't know a thing about the Word of God. When I learn something, I'll be the first to go. A year later, I was ready to go, but I wasn't at first. So I had the office and the calling and the ordination from heaven and all that, but I refused to do what some did, jump in before I was ready. And then I had a pastor for a while, and then I left that. And you see, I didn't cease to be an elder, didn't lose the title or the office because... I wasn't pastoring for a while. Then I was interim pastor for a while, still in college. And then they called a pastor, and there, by the way, <laughs> I heard somebody wanted to call him because he promised that he wouldn't preach over 20 minutes, and he kept his word on that. 20 minutes. <laughs> Why well, takes me longer than that to read the text sometimes? But, uh, <laughs> but anyway... And then I was pastor of another church for a while. 
then left that and began to teach in the seminary. I was still an elder, you see. If you say pastor, that sounds like church. But if you say elder, then I still held the office. Now, if I was going to continue to be just a teacher, then I would move into another office. But then God moved me out of that back into pastorate, so it's elder and teacher. And then receive the Holy Spirit, then definitely the confirmation that the teaching aspect of the twofold responsibility of the elder's office would be emphasized. Of course, I always did that anyway, but very definitely after becoming charismatic. So what I'm saying is that you keep the title and office for life according to the word but it assumes you're functioning but not necessarily without interruption I mean if a pastor retires I don't believe in retiring but some good old Christian souls do he doesn't cease to be an elder he's got the title and office the office is a gift that Christ gave to men when he ascended on high that's the office man doesn't cease to be an apostle John didn't cease to be one when he got so old that they say he became ancient there and they carried him into the church. And he's still the Apostle John. Peter, way over in 1 Peter 5, he says, I am an elder too. There's no record, and of course we know the apostles never pastored churches. By the way, which it may be important for you to know later, for some reason, that you can use elder in a general sense. But if you're being specific, then it means one who's functioning as an elder in a body. But Jesus is called an elder. Peter's called an elder. Paul calls himself an elder. None of them ever pastored churches. Jesus never pastored a church. So you can use it in a general sense. Like in our book, Charismatic Body Ministry, we say we have plurality of ministry. We have several elders in the body. We do, but if you're talking about pastors who are functioning as pastors, maybe only one besides myself right now is functioning as a pastor in a work, as a pastor. But they still hold the office. So it can be used in a general way because it's used of Paul, Christ, and Peter. Now, in some instances, an elder may disqualify himself for a while. He may cease to meet the qualifications for the office and temporarily remove himself from functioning. But that doesn't mean he's no longer an elder. It just may, you know, be problems that where he's not meeting 1 Timothy 3 requirements and he steps aside for a while. It doesn't make him unfit for membership in the local body, but if a man does not meet those qualifications, he ought either to meet them or step down till he can. Sometimes he's asked to step down if it's of the nature where he is wrong, but sometimes he just may not feel qualified. Take a man who comes out of the institutional system, receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And about all he's been in, that's a religious administrator because that's really all they want. Gets the Holy Spirit, walks into this new spiritual dimension and says, well, I don't know anything about the Word. All I know is denominational life. And like I did in my first year, I said, I'm not qualified. I don't meet those qualifications. If zeal's enough, yes. <laughs> but doesn't mean you don't hold the office, the callings from heaven. There are a lot of reasons I'm saying that you may not be functioning just at that time, but it doesn't mean you've lost the office. As we suggested sometimes, one who is serving as a pastor, we think of an elder as a pastor so often, may move into another ministry like teaching. We've had some that's doing that. So they're elders in a general sense, but technically they're teachers. You see, if all I did was teach, travel and teach or whatever, then I'm a teacher. I'm not functioning as an elder. I'm only an elder in a general sense, like Peter said he is and Paul. They were apostles. But if you're talking about the office per se, then you have to be functioning in it as we said, not without interruption always, but be functioning in it or you'd be no point in you being an elder. And we're not thinking of those who are retired or whatever, are temporarily between pastors. Now, here's an important thing to keep in mind. Although an elder holds the office and title for life, yet he cannot exercise his authority unlike the apostle or prophet. He cannot exercise his authority in other local churches unless asked to do so by the local body. See, he holds a title and office for life, 
But unlike the apostle or prophet who are no wise bound to a local body with respect to their authority, unlike apostle or prophet, he cannot exercise his authority of eldership in a local body unless he's asked to do so. Now, the reason for that will become obvious if you've been in most churches or if you've been in church, because sometimes trouble has arisen when a retired minister, an elder, or one between pastorates joins with a local body and then begins to exercise his eldership and authority among the members of that body. Often meaning well, often meaning well, that isn't what we're saying. But it causes division in the body. We should be very careful as elders in another body not to fall into the snare of the devil and start ministering to individuals or a little group that began to look to that person as pastor. Yeah. And that happens in the larger bodies. And we need teaching along this line because it causes division and strife. Don't ever fall into that snare of letting somebody in the body or a group say, well, you are more reachable or you seem to appeal to us and our needs more, or for whatever reason they say, don't fall into that snare of start letting them consider you their pastor. Now, we know out of experience that these things happen, and we may know it when you didn't know we knew it. What we're not saying is that you can't exercise your rights of prayer and counseling and ministering to the whole body. We encourage the whole body to minister. That isn't what we're saying. In fact, I'd be disappointed if the elders didn't minister to this whole body. That isn't what we're saying. I've had people come up here and say, well, I didn't even know I could talk to you. You know, they have such a respect for you and all that. Well, praise God for the respect, but if you watch this big long line after each service, you'll see some either don't have respect or rather, <laughs> or it doesn't make that much difference to them. That uh, is the way it should be. But for whatever reason, I mean, whoever's up here there's somebody else out there that can become your pastor if you're not careful. It just has happened. Let's leave it at that. But this doesn't mean they can't exercise their spiritual gifts. They are elders. We respect them for that. We, we appreciate that. And that's what we encourage. You've heard us encourage it over and over again. Don't wait to try to get to see me. There are other elders in the body or other ministry. And in fact, every one of us, for that matter, can minister to you. So it's good to know where the limits of our authority lie. Since my call an elder between pastorates, when I was in seminary, I was a member of a body there that was teaching the word as they knew it, as best you can teach it without the Holy Spirit, but at least they were teaching the word. A man with a doctor's degree and like an old Pentecostal meeting in the sense that it was in a store building, little old storefront, it used to be a grocery store, seat about 50 people. Well. Here I was in graduate school, but that really ministered to me. I never once, as an elder, ever tried to exercise any authority in there except to help as I was requested to do, when I would be, whether it's to fill in and speak or I even took the offering once and that sort of thing. To me, it's clear. I've never had to been taught this, and I don't mean that I know more than anyone else, but I just seem to know my place was not to overstep my authority, but to help wherever I could. Wouldn't have to be asked to help. It does happen and has happened that some look to someone else as their pastor. You see, you're falling into snare as a minister when you do that. You're the one falling into snare because you're saying there's a division in this body, there's something not right, and I'm going to minister to that whatever it is that's not right. You should say, wait a minute, there's your pastor standing up there. He's your pastor. Now, if I can help you, I'll be glad. That's the way I'll do it. Hallelujah. All right. The ordination of elders. How about that? Been waiting for that, I know. Ordination. I trust it doesn't humble any elders because I've gone through the ordination service too and I've had the hands laid on and I've got their certificates at home and the license and the whole bit. So I've got as much to lose or more than some of you by saying it. But the Bible does not teach, New Testament does not teach an ordination of ministers. There's no formal ordination service of ministers in the New Testament. 
Now, if we can't prove it, then we wouldn't say it. The King James Version, in the King James Version, you have the word ordain used five times. It's translated five times, ordain. With respect to ministry, five times. All five of those times, you've got five different Greek words. And none of them mean ordain. Well, it's good to know what we need to know. So what we're saying is that the English word ordain in the King James Version never refers, the words that are actually used in the Greek, never refer to a ceremony, a formal ceremony, which we call in the churches an ordination service. Of course, that shouldn't be any problem to anybody that has discovered tonight. If this is the first time you discover it, you get your ordination from heaven anyway. Amen. People have asked me about ordaining them from this church. There's no basis in the New Testament for it. We've never done it. We're not going to start it. I tell them, if you've got a call, then you're already ordained from the one who does the ordaining, which is Jesus. Now, we may lay hands on somebody if the Lord directs, but we'll get to that later. We're not saying there isn't something that we see there that they're doing setting people apart sometimes man cannot ordain a man i trust that we've said sufficient that you already know what we're getting at but there are five different words all translated as ordain in the king james never do they refer to a formal service of ordination of ministers i'm not going to write the words greek words i'll give you the passages and tell you what they mean, and those of you who are studying Greek can go look them up for yourself in the passage. Mark 3.14, Acts 1.22, Acts 14.23, 1 Timothy 2.7, and Titus 1.5. All right, now we can look at those, and then I'll tell you what the Greek term is. Mark 3.14, first of all. Now, what does it say? And he ordained twelve. The apostles. Jesus ordained twelve. Now, the Greek doesn't say he ordained them. See, we have this idea of ordaining, and if you're not ordained by the Baptists, then you can't serve in the Baptist denomination. First thing the state wants to know, if you take a deduction on income tax for your expenses going to meeting and back, are you ordained? No, then you can't deduct that. Anyway, this is the ordaining of the twelve. The word is to make. It's the Greek word to make. I'll just give you the one and then I'll not write the others. Poi, eh o oh. means to make or do. So it says he made twelve. Apostles. All right, that's the first use. Now let's look at the second. He made the twelve apostles. The word means to make or do, not ordain. Acts 122. This is getting a replacement for Judas. Peter's talking. He said, it must be someone, let's begin with verse 24, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And so it must be a man beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's ordaining an apostle to take Judas's place. So they'll have twelve. But it has to be someone that was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry to the resurrection, to witness the resurrection. But the Greek word is not ordain again. It means to become. It's the word to become. It must be someone to become a witness with us of his resurrection. He didn't say there must be one ordained to be a witness, but there must be one to become a witness with us of his resurrection. Well, that isn't even close to ordain. They're just asking God to choose one to become a witness with them. 
And then Acts 14:23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, well, the word again is not ordained, but the word here is having chosen, to choose. Acts 14, 23, to choose. And when they chose elders in every church, see, are in the churches, of course, we've already said. So this is the word to choose. So again, it's not ordained, like a formal ceremony. We're not saying they're not appointed. In fact, the whole idea is to appoint someone to an office and not ordain, because that has taken on a denominational meaning that isn't in the New Testament. Then 1 Timothy 2.7. First Timothy 2.7, Paul says, Wherefore I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. What he actually said was, I was appointed a preacher and apostle by Jesus, of course. I was appointed. The word is to appoint. And the last reference, Titus 1.5. Paul speaking to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. What he said, appoint elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. Appoint them. So in other words, nowhere does ordain occur in these passages that are translated ordain. So if we sum all that up, we're talking about the usage here. What do we see where ordain is in the translated in these passages. We have to make one an apostle. We have to become a witness as an apostle. We have to appoint as an apostle, preacher and apostle. And then only two with reference to elders, and one says to choose elders, and the other appoint elders. Now where you get the service from, I don't know. I can't even by any stretch of the imagination and I suppose I've studied the word as much as anybody in the church. And I'm thinking now from Matthew all the way through Revelation, I can't think of any place where you could find an ordination service going on like we see in our churches. Ordaining men, licensing them, let them preach a year and prove themselves, then ordain them as an elder of that denomination. So we'll have only two references to elders in these five, and they are appointment in those cases, choosing and appointing. Now, what we do have, what we do see, what the New Testament does reveal is a laying on of hands, not a ceremony. You don't even have a suggestion of that. But a laying on of hands in connection with appointment to ministry. You sometimes see the use of the laying on of hands with appointment to ministry. And that's sometimes. Not in any of those passages we looked at, by the way. I'll give you the three where you see the laying on of hands. Acts 6.6. 6, Acts 13.3. And 1 Timothy 4.14. All right, we'll look at those, because here we do see there was something that took place sometimes that was significant, and that was a laying on of hands. And Acts 6, verse 6, this is the early church, and these are not elders, this is not the fivefold ministry, these are servants going to help in the needs there of the church, the work. I'm sure you're familiar with the passage. There were problems there about feeding and daily ministration. And the twelve called the multitudes and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, fully the Holy Spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. Not ordain, but appoint. And then verse 6, When they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. 
Now that isn't just a formality. These are apostles laying hands on these men. We can assume there's an impartation of empowering and grace and whatever's needed because one of these later on becomes quite an evangelist. Remember who he was? Philip, yeah, over in Acts 8. He really got the whole town saved there in Samaria. And we see there is an impartation in 1 Timothy 4.14. There is an impartation of something in 1 Timothy 4.14. Now, it doesn't mean there has to be an impartation of a gift or something, but of the anointing blessing of the Lord. Spiritual impartation. 1 Timothy 4.14. Neglect not the gift. Now, look at that. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery or of the eldership. So he got a gift through the laying on of hands. And it was prophesied, the gift. When they laid their hands on him, that was the impartation of the gift. And they prophesied the gift. Not the presbytery like we've got in the denominational system, a presbytery, but he says by the elders, the eldership, the elderhood, as one Greek translation gives it, the elderhood. Then Acts 13.3 is the other laying on of hands in connection with appointment or impartation of something. This is Paul and others at the church at Antioch. There were in the church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, another one was Saul among that list. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the church, are the elders? No, by the Holy Spirit departed. And so the laying on of hands is significant, but twice we're told it's the Holy Spirit who does the separating, the appointing, and the sending forth. And so in Acts 6.6, 6, we have appointment through the laying on of hands. In Acts 13, 3, we have separation unto the work the Holy Spirit appointed them to. They didn't appoint them or send them, but they separated them unto the work they'd been sent to. And then in 1 Timothy 4, 14, you have an impartation of a gift of the Spirit. Now, on the basis of that, we get developing in the ecclesiastical system a formal ordination service where all of these ideas are brought together. You know, they're not even together, but they're brought together, and they take the King James word ordain, which doesn't occur in those passages that we gave you, and then take the idea of the laying on of hands, and while today the denominations will disavow anything being imparted, yet it is a sacred ceremony that they must lay hands on your head though they don't believe that anyone but an apostle in the first century could have really imparted anything. But they do have the formality, and it doesn't occur in the New Testament. You can't get what we see in our churches out of those passages, and that's where they get it. Now, the elements you see here in the laying on of hands, which does occur, and it doesn't say always, but we see it occurring three times here, what we see, the elements in that is the imposition of hands and prayer, apparently praying each time they do it, and sometimes fasting in connection with it. So I'd say we'd be led of the Spirit if we're to lay on hands whether or not we should pray and fast, as they did in Acts 13. Again, you can't build a formal way of doing things from those passages. Another thing we see about this, the laying on of hands is by the ministry, by the elders. 1 Timothy 4.14, it was the eldership, the elders. In Acts 6, it was the apostles. And in Acts 13, it was the prophets and teachers. 
So when it's to be done, apparently it is to be done by the elders. When you're being separated, a gift imparted, appointed to an office, then obviously the Lord would use ministry to do it, though he wouldn't have to be limited to that.